Well, good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome to Agri-Food Conversations brought to you by iSelect Fund, the Van Trump Report, the Yield Lab Institute, and Family Farms Group. Um, my name is David Yoakum. I'm an associate on the iSelect Fund Ventures team. I'm excited to welcome you to our discussion today. Agri-Food Conversations is all about driving innovation in agriculture. Each month, we highlight a specific theme, uh, including emerging topics such as soil health, plant genetics, vertical farming, and aquaculture, to name a few. This month's theme um, is the agricultural supply chain. And on today's call, we're joined by Frank Pika, CEO of Native. Native is the only ag-focused software platform on the market that uses end-to-end -end data and artificial intelligence to optimize products and supply chains, converting consumer insights into actual decisions that improve product formulations, supply chains, and outcomes. Uh, Native has combined all of the applications that producers need to engage and understand their consumers, predict market trends, and create products with better outcomes. Each of you knows that companies are more likely to succeed with the right network of customers, talent, investors, and advisors. We have invited you to this call because you're some of the smartest, most talented people in Native's market. You are potential customers for Native's products and services. You've built a company similar to Native's, or you are a sophisticated business person or agricultural professional who understands the market and the challenges and opportunity Native may face. Now, before we get started, we have a quick poll question to get a better idea of who we have on the call today. Please take a few seconds to answer. Uh, and while that poll is running, um, a few comments. Uh, we are not soliciting investment. This presentation is to provide information to help Native find customers, mentors, and other strategic relationships to help them grow their business. You are all on mute, and you can use the chat window to ask a question at any time. Uh, finally, this presentation is being recorded and will be available for replay. So without further delay, I am pleased to introduce Frank Pika, CEO of Native. Frank, please feel free to take it away. Thank you, David. Glad to be here. Um, so yeah, look, I'll kind of kick things off with some brief background about how we got here and uh, where the company's at today. So we started this company over two and a half years ago, my co-founder Sarah and I, and uh, we started with a thesis around traceability within that supply chain. And I think at that time, uh, between the IBM food trusts of the world and uh, numerous other players in the space, you know, people limited a lot of traceabilities, um, capabilities to things like food safety and things that weren't necessarily commercially viable at times for a lot of companies and stakeholders along that food and beverage supply chain. And so as we continue to evolve, um, what we've you know, continuously realized is that this is a consumer driven market and more and more we are moving towards this idea of customization and even more long-term personalization of food and beverage. And um, that today is what uh, Native is helping companies do within the space is to again, address these issues that we see in the market and fill really the demand that we're seeing from consumers. So we have a nice little graphic here for you just to show this kind of ever-changing preference. But um, one example I always like to give is, you know, again, yesterday's non-GMO quickly became today's plant-based um, type ingredients. And in an ecosystem and industry that is as fast moving as what we're seeing today in food and historically was just producing food at mass simply so we could just feed the population. Um, we got a lot of companies, including your top 100 um, CPG kind of food and beverage companies that were caught on their heels. Um, down there in the left, you can kind of see, you know, this respectively is the amount of revenue that is reinvested into the R&D departments at these four companies. So you can see Amazon and Google respectively at 13 and 15%, Nestle and Catalog two and one. Um, what we've noticed is that these budgets have actually fluctuated with those top 100 food and beverage companies over the years and over the last 20 years to be exact. Um, however, when they tried to raise those budgets um, past those marks in terms of, you know, again, overall revenue reinvested, they were actually seeing diminishing returns and the amount of innovation and, and ROI coming from that innovation. Um, so not to say that these companies aren't innovating today, but what we're seeing is um, a lot of those budgets and a lot of those dollars actually flow into more of the M&A departments uh, because they know in a very consumer driven market that they're younger, more agile and more innovative companies um, that have a great understanding of the end consumer and what those end consumers are actually asking for from today's food. Um, David, I think I watched one of your past webinars and you actually brought up um, things like nutrition, better for the world, um, you know, again, better for the ecosystem. You know, we use the word personalization because my preferences as a consumer may be different from yours, but um, ultimately we're all, you know, wanting something very specific and very niche um, from our foods. And so what we found again is in today's ecosystem, we have about 30,000 
new CPG products launched each year in the US. And this creates a scenario where you have a ton of losers and just a few winners. So the name of the game for anyone and, you know, again, food production or beverage production becomes how do I launch more SKUs to market, but how do I de-risk that, right? And how do I bring them to market with more accuracy to where I know there's a uh, sure-footed um, consumer and um, again, a dollar at the other end of that product. Solution we've actually created, um, you know, isn't too dissimilar from, you know, stuff that actually works really well, right? So we use the consumer panel metaphor as a way to kind of simplify what we've done. But ultimately, consumer panels are great. Um, and that feedback is extremely valuable during the innovation phase of any product and of any single one of these companies trying to bring that to market. Um, what we quickly realized was that there, there was troves of consumer data online. Um, in fact, I spent my last decade in marketing and advertising tech. And what we did specifically was follow and map um, consumers online and around the web to understand what copy and what type of images they would click on and what's going to essentially trigger them, right? So what are their interests and what are their behaviors associated with that? So when we took a look at the space and you have someone like Amazon with over 60% of online grocery, um, and then you got you know, massive behemoths like Walmart. Um, you have Shopify's, which, you know, again, if you're producing a product today and you want to go direct to consumer is a fantastic tool. Um, there's comments and feedback left by consumers on all of these platforms and sources. And so what we do is we go out and fetch that data and we identify um, products and again, food and beverage. And we ingest all of those um, comments and feedback that exists around the web. And then our intellectual property actually sits here. So we use a specific form of artificial intelligence called natural language processing. And what that allows us to do is take something like a review online and read that just like you and I would as a human would. And um, what I mean by that is we take in consideration everything from the sentiments of that comment. So the actual emotions that the consumer is feeling as they left it. But we can also take into consideration things like semantics, um, which at scale are actually very difficult to pull off. And what I mean by that is if we see reviews around a specific product and they were mentioning the word expensive, right? Expensive was a keyword that continuously came up. Maybe it came up 50 times. Well, it very well could be that 25 or half the time that the word expensive came up, the consumer is actually referring to the quality of the product and not necessarily the price, right? So maybe they're describing a shirt as being expensive um, or the packaging as you know expensive feel. Um, so those are all the types of considerations that you have to take in and be able to analyze as a company. If you try to take, you know, again, consumer feedback online and translate that into ultimately um, insights and actions that these companies can take uh, to their own supply chain. So I'll have a few examples um, and I'll kind of continue to give you these, but one of the big ones and one of the ones I enjoyed most um, was um, Jorn from, from Oatly. Uh, we had a great conversation and I was talking to him about uh, what he thought was um, Oatly's biggest pro, right? What, are, what is everyone talking about? What do the consumers love about your product? And so one of the things he brought up was sustainability. And I said, you know what? You're, you're completely right. Consumers actually love the fact that your product is sustainable. It's probably one of the biggest reasons that they make that decision to purchase on digital or physical shelves. Um, but what he didn't realize also at the time was it was one of their bigger detriments to, to the brand. So they had launched a sustainable packaging that was literally falling apart before it got into refrigerators. And that's the type of information that we can help, um, you know, again, these companies and these products uncover. Um, but as we continue to kind of digest this data and analyze it for any one of these companies, right? And this one is Drink Poppy, for example, at Kabu Ventures. Um, we begin to actually analyze in real time and use the AI to understand that consumer feedback around specific qualities. So we mentioned packaging in the Oatly example, but you can also begin to digitize things like the sensory of a human being, right? And what they think of flavor. And the complexity behind this is why I think we have a very innovative company today and why it's such a problem that these CPG companies are looking to solve is just, again, very complex. So one of the ways that we actually develop these algorithms is to first get a benchmark, right? And the benchmark understanding of what a review looks like when the uh, customer or consumer mentions something like flavor. And then how do you begin to measure that? 
So we'll take something like an Amazon review, for example, and someone will say the flavor and taste of this product was really great, uh, very savory. And then they'll rate it, you know, four to five stars. So we'll take that. We'll use our technology to find every type of keyword and every, you know, mix of words that would essentially equate to a synonym of that statement. And then we go out and we can actually scrape the rest of the web, whether that be from Twitter, whether that be from Reddit, where there's unstructured kind of feedback around products. And we can actually bake that in and allow these companies to benchmark week over week, month over month, or even day over day, um, their progress on things like freshness, flavor, and even packaging and value for money. Um, I think the most important thing that you can uncover as a brand working with us is these are essentially very early indicators or warning signs um, of success or even something, you know, negative like quality control. Um, we've had companies compare us to an IRI or, you know, a Nielsen, for example. Um, in reality, you know, those companies have existed for years and years and point of sales data is simply table stakes. Um, so what we're most interested in is companies that truly say that they are innovative. And if the point of sales data and Nielsen's IRIs and spins of the world are table stakes, then what are these companies doing to identify early warning signs and data points um, that essentially allow them to innovate faster and on a more real-time basis than a retroactive report around point of sales data if you're looking at you know, monthly or quarterly reports from your retailers. Last but not least, this is typically kind of a phase three that we work with our partners. Um, we wanna truly turn these insights that we derive into actions they can take against either their supply chain or even, you know, again, bake right into their manufacturing process. And so the example here you're looking at is something very quite simple and straightforward um, and something I think also that a lot of uh, indoor ag and uh, your leafy green grower, growers would squawk at, but um, it says 68% of consumers are showing concern over basil being too expensive. And so if you look here to the right, what our platform would suggest is something like optimized pricing, obviously. Um, to give you a little bit more complexity behind um, the layers here and kind of peel away the onion, if you truly look at how our platform um, could be integrated to something like a vertical company, um, let's say um, even something like cannabis, um, you have a, an operator that not only cultivates, um, they then manufacture and they retail, right? So they sell that product to a consumer. Those are the types of companies that attaching our framework um, can be so powerful for, right? As the industry continues to move more vertically um, to control quality, but also to innovate even faster, um, we can actually derive insights that can be translated, like I said, directly into actions um, that optimize everything from ingredients. So that non-GMO of yesterday, which is today's plant-based, um, to even things like uh, skew rationalization. Um, so if I have 20 products, but only shelf space in Kroger for five, uh, which of my 20 products do I choose and why? And then also, do I look at that in a regional basis or a localized basis? And how do I make those decisions? Um, so those are some of the use cases. But um, I also wanted to give just a quick example of some of our customers. So today, um, we're working with some of the most, I think, forward-thinking and innovative brands in the industry. Um, you know, App Harvest being one who recently went public this year. Um, we have Milk Bar for those of you on the uh, East and West Coast um, who enjoy your desserts. Um, and then we have someone like Everybody Eat, who's uh, a little bit younger uh, as a company, but we think has an enormous amount of potential and they're creating a portfolio of allergen-free products. Um, where we see the future is places like AB InBev who have, you know, again, a great vertical understanding of their supply chain and places like Barley, um, or even a Kraft Heinz with uh, Steve Sanger over there, who, again, is continuously looking at ways to innovate their products and customize them based on consumer needs. And then last but not least, um, again, I wanted to show something like Bee Leaf, as I mentioned, um, cannabis. And for those of you who are in the Missouri market, uh, probably know Mitch Myers and Bee Leaf over there, but they're doing some incredibly interesting stuff. And the platform and vertical infrastructure of that company allows us to help them innovate um, at a speed and pace that uh, probably hasn't been seen in, in quite a while. Also wanted to show you guys some use cases, which should just load here in one second. Um, for these use cases, just move this. <clears throat> we're seeing, like I said, AI being so widespread and with so many applications that um, 
sometimes it's actually difficult for um, these companies to understand and identify where they can use it. Um, so we took the luxury of actually plotting um, these use cases and we measured it on um, two different things, basically success rate of that implementation. And then also something like the impact, right? The positive impact it could have on the overall business. Um, so I'll leave this behind um, as, as a link for you guys, but you can see here, production process optimization is actually something with the highest impact. Um, but as you can, you can see on the implementation success rate, it's at about 60%. So it's not exactly easy or someone, you know, again, uh, for the jump in and use artificial intelligence and something like natural language processing to help optimize that process. On the other hand, something like quality assurance is pretty high up on, um, again, not only the impact level, but it also has a very high um, success rate of implementation. Um, as you can see here, you know, we see AI in the CPG and food and beverage category being used across everything from supply chain to customer care to things that uh, we continue to focus on, which is marketing consumer intelligence. And we don't see that stopping anytime soon. Um, these are the companies that will continue to innovate quickly. And these are the companies that will continue to have longevity just based on the way that they're automating this kind of end-to-end -end feedback. We have uh, three different tools that, um, again, we currently offer to the market. Um, I'm going to continue to elaborate up at our gateway products, which is consumer market data and then how we translate those into insights. Um, but I'll get to the supply chain management tool in just here a second. Um, one of the other very interesting ways that we are collecting data, um, because we are agnostic, right, to how we collect that consumer feedback. Um, but one, which is a common theme among every company is, hey, we just want more brand awareness. We want consumers to engage deeper with our product. And we want to understand what is driving, right, those consumers to purchase our products um, on physical and digital shelves. And so we help cut companies through the forms of QR codes on packaging, as you can see here, um, that they can simply scan. They can be incentivized for scanning, but they can also leave direct feedback. So we not only pick up things like demographic information and even things like geolocation data, um, which can be extremely powerful as these brands and um, again, production companies continue to um, you know, again, personalize or customize that product based on um, a variety of different criteria. Uh, but we can also begin to capture first party data, which historically has been very difficult and only gotten harder for these companies to collect. Um, because of big retailers like a Walmart or like an Amazon. And so what I mean by that is if I am Coca-Cola or if I am AB InBev and I have to go through at least two parties, right? Let's say a distributor um, and then a retailer before I reach that end consumer, my line of sight to who that end consumer truly is, um, is blocked. And so this is one of those solutions that's quite simple and almost a no brainer um, that they can stick on packaging to find out who is actually engaging with their product. And then you can extrapolate that data and create things like lookalike models um, that allow these companies to innovate more quickly, but also find gaps and realize that uh, they may be able to fill other voids um, in these consumers' minds, of uh, products or ingredients that they're looking for today. Um, quick snapshot of just kind of the dashboard, but the, uh, the other thing that I'll continue to kind of dwell on here is the need for these companies to benchmark against their competition, um, not only from a sales perspective, but, um, you know, again, for a lot of these earlier stage um, companies, even like a Beyond Meats or, you know, again, an Impossible Foods, um, what they're trying to do is obviously benchmark against their competition and even identify things in real time, like how their product tastes stacked up against, uh, you know, again, one of the uh, legacy meats. And so um, these are the types of data points that Native allows you to collect in real time. And again, it's very real time, uh, proactive, um, you know, indicators that the product either having success and there's going to be a ton of room for growth um, or, um, you know, again, this is a good stopping point. We should put this one to bed and, you know, rethink our strategy. Again, quick snapshot, um, but this is also tying into, again, the manufacturing. So we do have um, a lightweight um, ERP 
system that is basically used by, I would say, your, your kind of mid-tier CPG companies um, and production companies manufacturing. So what this allows us to do is, like I said, kind of automate that process between consumer feedback and all of that data. We can then use those insights and then actually even automate tasks and projects um, into the ERP system that will actually drive and fuel future innovation for that company. Um, so as we begin to talk about automation in the space uh, and you look at something like even micro fulfillment centers that uh, weren't really a topic of conversation, you know, a decade ago, um, we've created the infrastructure for not only customization from a localized or regional perspective, but we believe the entire world and our thesis is heading towards this idea of personalization, not only of things like nutrition and health, uh, but also can you customize even the flavor profiles, right, of something like uh, maybe a tomato. Um, produced an app harvest facility that uh, could be a little bit more savory uh, for someone like David, but maybe has a little bit of a sweeter taste for someone like myself. Um, so these are the types of things that we're thinking about and continue to innovate around. The results for us have always been around commercial viability for our client partners. And so there's really three things that we can create through this technology. One, simply, hey, we can drive more profits and we can also increase the amount of loyalty that consumers feel towards your product. Um, thanks to something like that personalization, right? So if I have a customer that tries my product and we want them to stick, um, how do we do that? How do we understand all that feedback in real time to where the next time they come back and find our product on the shelf, um, you know, again, they're keen to buy it again, or, you know, again, at least not go for one of our competitors. Um, the last thing is again, kind of that traceability and transparency throughout the supply chain. So I mentioned it before, but the companies that'll probably see the greatest value in what we're doing are ones that are already trying to move towards this kind of verticalized nature. Um, you can see it in the quality of products coming from things like Costco. You can see it in white labels coming from even, um, or I'm sorry, private labels, even coming from places like Target. Uh, but the idea here is how do we bring the consumer closer together with the point of origin to where that control of quality um, is not only, you know, kind of obvious, uh, but it's actually within our own hands. And so um, vertical companies are great, but equally so we work with quite a few companies and uh, younger stages and earlier stages that have a very difficult time. Um, actually acquiring data um, and they don't have the budgets for things like Nielsen and their IRI or even a Centauri Spins who start at, you know, 20K a year. Um, so these are also, you know, again, um, pockets of customers for us and client partners that we can bring on and lend a wealth of knowledge to. In terms of the addressable market, you know, we'll continue to see this grow at enormous speeds. Um, I wanted to take real quickly and just kind of give you, again, I gave the use cases on where we see kind of AI falling and, um, you know, again, these CPGs lapse. Um, but ultimately, even if we look at just something like the US, um, you know, it's quite an attractive market. Um, and like I said, with the amount of movement happening in the space, um, everything from nutrition to kind of customization here. AI is going to be a key component on how we understand these troves of data that would otherwise be rendered useless, right? Sitting in uh, different silos. And so uh, one of the keys, like I said, to unlock this is going to be AI. And we view that market as being very attractive. Um, another thing I wanted to point out for you guys is just simply how quickly, um, you know, growth can happen. Um, so what we did here is we plotted out just a few of the contracts um, that, and this is actually discounted, but, Places like Coca-Cola as a holding company spend enormous um, budgets on measuring place in places like Nielsen, Spins, um, and even IRI. And so even at a discounted rate um, and at scale, if we were to capture, you know, again, 500 of Coca-Cola's brands, um, you can see that the contract size is, is again, quite large. And, and this is just kind of the beginning. In terms of just kind of stage, just a set, um, and even keel for everybody, you know, we, again, started this um, early 2019. Um, we've quickly um, seen traction, I would say, after, you know, again, second year, after we continue to kind of market position and uh, identify, you know, pain points that everyone was feeling. And so um, we had just launched our most recent product in Q3 of last year. And, um, you know, again, we're on quite a little streak that'll head into, uh, you know, again, later this year. 
quick financial production for you. Just again, I wanted to bring up uh, another key point here. I don't know how many of uh, the audience is here from St. Louis, but um, a very awesome exit, even though the company is now headquartered in um, Chicago, but Label Insight was a company that we grew up next to uh, when I was in St. Louis and they've done a phenomenal job. And um, they also help address, uh, measure, and identify trends um, similarly to what we do. But what took them, you know, again, almost 10 years um, and to get to a $100 million acquisition by Nielsen, uh, we believe we can get to similar revenue milestones in just three. Um, and that's exactly where we're going to sit. And I think that's a uh, indicator of how ready this industry is um, for technologies like ours to, again, evangelize, but also continue to be a catalyst um, for, you know, again, their innovation um, as consumers change. Last but not least, I uh, wanted to give you guys just, again, a brief uh, introduction to not only um, some of our cap table, but um, also some of the experience coming on our own team. Um, as you can see here, you know, we have a wide range of fairly strategic um, either backers or um, current team members um, that have diverse backgrounds, uh, but also just a wealth of experience in the space. Um, so you may look at me and be like, what the heck are you doing here? Um, I do not have a history in uh, food and beverage, nor truly in ag. Um, I come from, again, a kind of consumer data background, but um, what we do have is, you know, quite a few, um, you know, getting great names behind us and um, they're continuing to help us shape and uh, drive innovation in the space and really, you know, create a product that is fit for everyone from, you know, again, your nutrition company and ingredients company, all the way up to, you know, again, some of your major CPGs. Thank you. And that is it. Well, awesome. Frank, thanks so much for such an excellent presentation. Um, and honestly, really exciting to see all the progress of Native over the last couple of years. It's been a, been a little while since I've heard this story and um, that looks great. Story is really um, super interesting. So congrats on that progress. Um, for anybody who's in the audience today, if you have questions, I know we already have one um, that's been submitted. Um, the best way to do that is by typing your question into the Q&A box, um, and I'll answer them in the order that they uh, are received. Uh, just to kick things off with the first question from the audience, Frank, who are, who are Native's competition um, in, in regard to the use of NLP to turn customer reviews into actionable insights? Yeah, uh, that's a great question, David. So I think we've noticed um, players like TasteWise, um, I think originally based out of Israel um, as being, you know, again, um, you know, a similar player in the space, um, taking, I would say similar approaches with things like machine learning for price elasticity. Um, I'd also take a look at a company called Spoonshot, um, who's also been a very interesting player in the space and relatively new, but uh, great white papers and collateral. So give them a shout out for that. Um, I couldn't give you an exact answer as to their applications um, of natural language processing. And in fact, I think that's something that makes us probably most unique in the space. Um, even when we talked with Dunhumby um, and their venture arm and their lead innovation um, person, you know, one of the things that he had brought up to us is like, look, we're actually helping companies and CPG brands um, solve a lot of the same problems that you guys are helping them solve. However, we're using a totally different data set we're using a whole different methodology to, you know, again, tackling that problem. And so um, I think we're just at the infancy stages of NLP. In fact, like 2015 was probably, you know, the year that NLP became kind of common, um, you know, uh, language used around, you know, industries. Um, so, you know, again, that's uh, probably one of our, you know, most unique, um, you know, again, attributes and probably what's keeping, like I said, a lot of our intellectual property alive is just our sophistication on the uh, NLP side. Thanks, Frank. Um, you know, one thing, one thing I'm curious about, it, it reminds me of some work that, that we did a couple of years ago, thinking about opportunities to digitize food product development, um, is just around identific identification of long trends versus short term trends or fads. And so how you and how you inform, you know, major CPGs who when they release a new product, there's just so much risk because so much resources goes into building a product like that. And if it fails, just like massive spend. Um, and so I'm, I'm reminded, I remember Googling top food trends of like 2019 when I put, the, put this research together and like one of the top trends was unicorn cake, which was like this very specific kind of strange, bizarre type of trend. And so when you, within the context of your platform, your technology, how do you guys think about informing 
those, or, or do you see it as your role to help inform them of what is a long-term trend likely to be a long-term trend as opposed to something that really is sort of a short-term fad that maybe isn't built for like building a new product around? Yeah, I think that that's, again, another, you know, brilliant ask. You know, what we've noticed is, you know, we're, we're pretty good at undercovering trends. Um, and we're also really good at uncovering the, you know, again, um, volume of consumers out there, right? Or cluster of consumers that would essentially buy into, you know, said trend. I think what's, like you said, most difficult and takes an enormous amount of integration and, um, you know, maturity between, you know, two partners is, you know, again, how you basically crunch the cost benefit analysis uh, rather quickly, right? To de-risk, you know, bringing a new SKU to market or, you know, get a new product. And um, the, my short answer would be, look, we're probably not at a stage where we can de-risk, um, you know, again, whether or not a trend is going to stay alive for, you know, more than a couple of years. Um, however, uh, I think over time and with some maturity between some of these partnerships, uh, that is definitely well within the cards, but it does take um, transparency and, uh, you know, again, a, a tight relationship, I would say, with, with our type of client partners to make that happen, right? Because yeah. you're exposing everything from financials to, you know, getting the true cost behind um, bringing some of that stuff to market. And that uh, sometimes is not the easiest thing to convince those companies to part ways with or share. Gotcha. Um, it's super interesting. So thinking, thinking through a little bit of, because the thing that's interesting about, you know, platforms like this is they provide a lot of information and data and some of it's really the directly actionable kinds of data that somebody to make a, a, a decision in the short term and oftentimes can also be thought of as data that informs strategic thinking and planning in the long term. Can you, can you talk about like use cases where somebody might be using the platform from a standpoint of solving an acute pain point versus solving a long-term sort of strategic thinking and using the platform in one of those two different ways? Yeah, absolutely. So I can give, you know, a couple. One would just be, um, I think SKU rationalization kind of falls into that acute um, type scenario. And so, you know, someone like Milkbar um, who has the shelf space problem, right? So they're launching in Target. They're very bullish on Target being one of their better channels and they have a great opportunity. Problem is they have, you know, again, 20 plus SKUs and they have enough room, right, digitally and physically for, let's say, five. Um, they need to determine quite quickly and with data which of those SKUs is most appropriate for target and that shelf space and that demographic. Um, and, yes, they could use things like historical data points like what's worked in Amazon or what's worked in Walmart. But the reality is you have different shoppers with different preferences in different regions and even localities. And so um, that's one of those acute ones that I think we can sell for rather quickly with the type of data that we uncover. As we look at more kind of like long-term issues and, uh, you know, again, deeper seated issues, I think, um, you know, App Harvest, again, um, they're growing tomatoes today, but tomorrow they uh, have Ashley out West working on quite a few things that, uh, you know, again, she might be uh, thinking about what they're going to grow and, and their new facilities. Um, so, you know, that comes into, you know, what products can we truly bring to market and, and why do we do that? What voids can we fill? Um, similarly, um, someone like everybody eats and Trish Thomas, uh, who's a fantastic founder and professor over at Northwestern, um, you know, her portfolio of allergen free, um, brands and products are, is one that, uh, you know, is I think an awesome problem to solve for, right? So what we'd help, her do is identify um, products and consumers that have said they want an allergen free version of that product. Um, and then that is actually helping her to um, and make decisions on what SKU to launch next, uh, or essentially what product to launch next based on, like I said, that kind of cluster of consumers that, uh, you know, are demanding that product. Um, you know, and the same thing goes for even like a low sodium version, right? If we get uh, people saying that a beef jerky is, uh, you know, again, insanely too salty, right? Or it has too much sodium. Um, you know, over time, we collect enough data that, you know, the decision almost becomes obvious for these guys as long as you're monitoring it. Um, right. And it identifies, you know, a pool of consumers that they otherwise wouldn't have catered to. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Frank. We have two more uh, two more questions from the audience, and I think we'll probably wrap things up after that. So, if you do have questions, um, please uh, please type them type away. Um, so, question number one here: um, How do you see your work here connecting with agri- agricultural production in addition to insights around sales, if at all? Um, it's a great question. I think you know. Again, I'm gonna. <laughs> 
a little bit lightly here, but you know, what we're doing um, in places like Buffalo with, um, you know, agile indoor growers and, and even um, longer term ambitions with someone like App Harvest is you can get very specific with the types of changes that you can make back on the production facility uh, based on consumer feedback. And so um, these companies historically have relied on, so for example, App Harvest relies on Mastronardi and their head growers for kind of tribal knowledge on what tomatoes should look, feel, and even taste like. Um, the reality is that's not their, their end consumer at the end of the day. And they need to find more data points from that end consumer that drives um, what they do during, again, the production phase um, or grow phase of that product. And so for ag, I think what's extremely interesting, especially in the indoor scenario, is the versatility and changes that you can make, um, even with something like the exposure to, you know, getting the light, right? So exposure to light. Um, you know, high versus low can impact everything from shelf life to even like the hue and the, the color of, you know, again, the, the product itself. And while you have genetics companies and seed companies working towards, you know, again, creating uh, seeds that are specifically designed for indoor, you know, who's to say that consumer preferences don't change over time and how are they collecting that data quickly? And then how can they make, you know, small changes during the production phase and actual impact, right? Or have a, a positive impact on that outcome. And so I think that's probably what's most interesting in kind of this like deep rooted scenario that, that uh, you could truly take feedback from Kroger consumers and they think the tomatoes are you know, get too red and you can actually tone that down, you know, again, within uh, one grow cycle. Yeah, definitely well put. Um, but Frank, the final question here, well, second to last question, uh, any special challenges related to the data collection process for you guys? Uh, I wouldn't say challenges. I mean, I think uh, with anything, you're, you're trying to find the most organic form of feedback from a consumer possible. And so um, the QR codes, um, you know, are interesting in the fact that uh, it's first party data and you can ask very specific questions that are tailored towards maybe the company's priorities. I think what's most interesting for me, and uh, we did the uh, space for food panel and uh, we were talking about NASA um, and, you know, again, what the future of food looks like, you know, even in outer space. And that is, look, you're going to find pockets of feedback um, uh, pretty much everywhere, right? So what was, you know, um, tribal knowledge or word of mouth um, quickly became, you know, again, now online. And so I think that'll continue to evolve. Um, who's to say that, again, we won't even be listening to like, you know, microphones soon, um, you know, again, picking up uh, feedback that way, as I'm sure, you know, a few companies already are doing. Um, but, you know, that's the type of thing that I think is interesting is the evolution um, and also the agility that will be needed on our side to continue to find those troves of data wherever they may exist. And so that's that's really our strategy is continue to be nimble and um, just ensure that we can collect data in whatever form it may take shape. Yeah, awesome. Well, uh, Frank, the last question that we have for you, um, what can the audience do to help you out here and how can they find you? Yeah, absolutely. So look, I think the um, biggest thing here for us would just be finding uh, more companies that uh, truly want to be innovative and that uh, do want to rely on a data driven strategy. Um, you know, I mentioned it before and I'll just mention it again. You know, if point of sales data is table stakes for these guys, you know, what are you know, the people in the audience doing to stay ahead and, and truly innovate? Uh, when looking at their competition. And so um, if you're having uh, challenges or you want a better understanding of which products you should bring to market, um, if you're having troubles with quality, if you're getting screwed over by your big retailer or Nielsen or higher eye, you know, come talk to us. Um, you know, we're in a stage right now that I think we're lending tremendous help to um, growth stage companies. And I think the NOTCOs of the world, the uh, Beyond Meats um, are all great opportunities and, um, you know, reasons that, uh, you know, you could use our data. Um, to continue to drive success and uh, market share in, in those types of places. So, yeah, I would just ask the network, um, you know, again, if you guys need that, come uh, reach out to me. I think my email is right here on the screen. I'm sure David will send it out afterwards. And then um, also just willing to connect anyone who wants to talk shop and, uh, you know, find <laughs> kind of this future of food interesting. So um, I mean, I'm here for any, any conversation. Excellent. Well, uh, Frank, thanks so much for joining us today. And again, congrats on all the progress uh, to date. I'd like to thank your, the audience for your, your great questions and active participation. Um, uh, for anybody who's new to this, we host these calls every Thursday at 3 p.m. Central Time, and you can register for Agri-Food Conversations as a webinar series by going to agrifoodconversations.com. And if you know someone would like to watch this webinar, feel free to share it with them. A replay of the webinar will be emailed to you in the next 24 hours, um, or any uh, newbies can go to agrifoodconversations.com to, uh, to view any of the videos from, from past webinars, including this one. Otherwise, to Frank, thank you so much. Thanks to our audience, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you, David. Appreciate it, man.
Bye.